I need to bring my shofar. That'll wake y'all up. I'm getting a little louder every day. All right, awesome. So listen, guys, we have our special speaker. This is Pastor John Elliott from Gulf Coast Foursquare Church. And we're really, really, really excited to have him. Uh, he's one of my bestest friends. He's been my pastor since I was a youth. He uh, married me, water baptized me. I got saved under his ministry. And he's been in ministry for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. So he has a lot of life experience to share with you with Christ. And a lot we can learn from the Spirit. Amen? I explained to him that our Sunday school is interactive. So if you have questions, whatever, he'll give you an opportunity for that, okay? So uh, let's go ahead and let's stand to our feet, open up with a word of prayer, mm -hmm. and then we'll get going. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for this is the day that you've made, that we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I pray for a precious Holy Spirit, Lord, Amen. to speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our souls, Father. Give each and every one of us, Lord, that fresh manna that comes from heaven, that rhema, that word, Father, that we need for our life so that we leave here a little bit changed, a little bit different, reflecting a little more the character and nature of our Savior today. Lord, thank you for Pastor John Elliott. Thank you, Lord, for his family. Thank you for his church. Thank you for his time, Lord, driving so many hours to be with us, Lord God. Mm. And Father, just let your grace and peace continue upon his life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Let's all open our Bibles to the book of Acts, the fourth chapter. The book of Acts, the fourth chapter. Sound man, would you help me a little bit this morning since I'm not used to your time? Give me a 10-minute warning and give me a five-minute warning, okay? Because I don't know, I don't know how to watch. I don't know. I'm not used to the system. So ten minute and five, so I can just make sure we do right here. Okay. So listen, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, this screen basically has the punchline in it about a secret life with God. Now I know that you feel like coming here. You know, you need to come up with something new if you're going to come in as a guest. But I'm finding out that what's keeping people alive is cornbread and beans. Seriously, it's what it's what's what keep you going. That's what's kept me going for 45 years. Um, several years back, uh, since I, I planted the church that I pastor, Foursquare uh, Four asked me to go assist one of our life Bible college professors in Dallas. They were doing a church of planters cohort. Is that how you say it? Cohort. And I was just to be his helper, you know, just to help make sure they got handouts, and which is fine. I mean, I you know. Um, and so it was a two-day conference, and it was a room just like this, filled with people from all over the United States that had already been basically trained, and this was the punchline before you get deployed. And so the professor continued to teach all kinds of things about church planting and your personal life and this, that, and the other. But, you know, we got to almost the end of this thing, and he was a little ahead of the ball game, and he said, John, after this break, I got to fill an hour. I need to fill an hour, and then I'm going to do the last hour, but would, why don't you just tell him what you thought was important about planting a church? And so I just gently wandered, wandered up there and talked to him about the amount of prayer that it took to dig a church out. Just that's all I talked about. I said there was nights I would spend six to eight hours in prayer, laboring. I mean, over, I didn't even know what to do. I'd never been trained formally by anybody. And so, so you got to get your wisdom from somewhere. So I, I mean, all I had was God's Bible and, and, and prayer and obedience. And so, and so I was just sharing that with him just kind of impromptly because, you know, I'm not the teacher. And so, um, and so I, and I talked to them about the spiritual warfare that many of them would come under. I mean, you're going into an area to dig out things, and you have got to calculate the fact that Satan is going to fight you tooth and nail, that he is not going to want to, God to send sharpshooters into a community. Are you guys okay with that? 
So, and I, so I said, you know, I'm sure that, you know, y'all been trained, what, for a year or two or something like that, and so I'm sure that, you know, all of you are spiritually prepared for the battle that is before you, because there is a casualty list that comes with this. There's many that did not go spiritually prepared. They did all kinds of academic things, nothing wrong with that, but what they left out was the real meat in the sandwich, which was your relationship with God. And so I just said, you know, would anybody in here, I said, let me just ask, is there anybody in here who feels like the Holy Spirit has exposed that weakness in your life that you've done everything but this? And brothers and sisters, the room exploded. People were laying prostrate on the floor. The professor was gone, and he came back in, and the whole thing was a train wreck. People are crying. Husbands and wives are over there weeping. People are laying prostrate on the floor. And I mean, I didn't even preach. I just shared a little testimony about digging out a church. And I mean, the Holy Ghost swept that place for two hours. And let me tell you what the testimony was. One of them stood up and said, man, I am guilty. We did everything but seek God. We're not ready to go into an area to dig the church out. And another one stood up and said, God, have mercy on me for doing everything but you know, spending time in the presence of God and getting God's wisdom and God's ability and God's power to go in there. And I was going to try to do it on my own and all of this stuff that's out there to be... Look, I once again, I, I, I don't want to sound like a guy who doesn't believe in training, but you've got to make sure you're hearing from the Holy Ghost. And so, and so probably five couples stepped out and said, we're going to finish the training, but we're going home and we're going to spend the next few months finding out what God's saying about this whole thing and getting ourselves spiritually prepped to go into warfare. So I'm saying that to you. These were spiritual leaders in our denomination. And so, you know, if that's what's going on in the pulpit, then you can imagine sometimes what's going on in the pew. So I'm going to say to you that every single one of us have been divinely ordained by God. Your neighbor, your neighborhood you're planted in is, is divinely ordained by God where you have. I mean, I have really got an epiphany going in my life because I, I, I woke up one day and thought, I don't even know any of my neighbors. I mean, that everybody lives in sealed houses and AC on. You don't ever see them. And I said, God, I'm not, you know, here I have been in this place 38 years and I only know about two or three neighbors. And, I, and let me tell you what, the Holy Ghost has opened it up. Once I started praying, you know how it starts working. All of a sudden, my next-door neighbor died of cancer and left his wife, who's my age. Uh, and she came over and my, saw me sitting out in the garage and said, well, she didn't even know I'm a preacher. She said, I'm going to blow my brains out. Oh, okay, have a seat. <laughs> And so for two hours, I just poured my heart out. I didn't preach to her. I just love this woman. She has been beat up all of her life. They were people who moved in. Nobody really knew. And they're very kind of freakish people. They're, uh, they work for casinos. And so nobody really knows them. But now Nancy <laughs> is part of the family. <laughs> and I'm just telling you. And then I got this crazy drunken redneck that lives at the end of the street that I almost wanted to fist fight one day. Because he is just a nutcase. But the Holy Ghost, man, has softened him and I. Him and I went out there on the ocean the other day and built a pier together. And I'm telling you what. That wall is falling for that redneck. I'm telling you, that wall is falling. So all I'm just saying to you guys is, is let, let me go ahead and just read the scriptures. So you don't think I'm not just coming in here to shoot the bull. But Acts, the fourth chapter in the fifth verse, and like Pastor said, if you have something to say or question, just raise your hand and I'll stop and acknowledge you in reference to what you want to say. But Acts, the fourth chapter, the fifth verse, can we stand while I read this? Just stand in reverence for the word. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers and elders and scribes, as well as, as Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were the family of the high priest, were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst of them, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, for if we this day are judged for our good deeds done to this helpless man, by what means 
by what means he has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Verse 11. And this is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief, chief cornerstone. Now is there, and is there salvation in any other? Is there any other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved? In verse 13, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled and realized that they had been with Jesus. Father, I ask you, Lord God, to help us see what you want us to see. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to break down strongholds that the enemy would try to set up in our minds. And God, we ask you, Father God, to help us see what you, the good shepherd, wants us to see individually as well as corporately. And God, we just thank you and praise you for it, Master. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So this is such a beautiful story, and there's so many different angles you could come at it from. But I remember when I first read this as a young Christian. Man, it really touched my heart to see. Because, you know, Look, they're really not giving a pass on people just to be stupid. <laughs> These were stupid people filled with the Holy Ghost. They were people who had not been to the religious schools of the day. And they had not been trained in high levels of religion. They were just, let's just say it like this, they were just common people like you and I. Just common people. And so, to me, that gives us such encouragement to know that the Holy Ghost... Is God is no respecter of persons. And I don't care if you got a fourth grade education or you are trained, in, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, Indian chief. It doesn't matter. God is no respecter of persons. He would love to fill you with the Holy Ghost and to make you a strong, strong tool in his hand. Somebody say amen. amen. So all I wanted to do was just say here, you know, we have, you know, and then when you go back and read, the letters in the book of uh, Revelations to the churches, the one that sticks out to me was how that they had left their first love. And guys, look, I, I, you know, I don't care if you're a mega church, a small church, or whatever. You've always got to maintain that. Just go back to the husband and wife relationship. You know, some of y'all remember when you first got married, how cute your wife was and how cute your husband was. And I mean, they couldn't do anything wrong. But then came a couple of kids. A layoff, this, that, another, and all of a sudden, you can be running a, a marital machine if you don't be careful. you got to fight to keep a, a marital relationship together, especially in the world right now that's so apostate. I mean, there's an antichrist spirit that's roaming this earth right now, and Pastor talked about it the other day. It's so, it's so manifested. I mean, everywhere you go, there's somebody after the marriage or the family. You're going to have to fight the good fight of faith, and you're going to have to be intentional. Sloppy Christians will get picked off in this last ride. Sloppy, lazy, unintentional Christians, you probably are going to get sniped by the enemy. Not because I'm some negative confession guy, because that's the way it works. You're going to have to cinch this thing up. We are actually moving into a storm. And there's a storm that would love to rip your home apart, rip your marriage apart. I mean, even right now, I've already got a pile of grandkids. And guys, I am having now to go back like a young dad and, and pray for my children. Now, my grandchildren, and I've already got one grandchild who's being picked off by the enemy. Now, I've, look, I say that that way, but I just mean, greater is he that is in me and greater is the prayers... And I stood before God and I said, God, they, they may try to get him, but you're going to get That boy has got seeds of righteousness planted in him. And Father, I will, I will, with my last dying breath, I will lay down intercession for my grandson and he will live to see the glory of the Lord. And I know what's happening here. Satan's trying to get at me, you know, from making an assault on his kingdom by going after my grandkids. Because the schools are so full of that garbage. That's where it got started at. He made a mistake to go into a school counselor. And before long, they got him all tangled up and a bunch of crazy talking. He said, Grandpa, I can't, have, I can't be your friend anymore. 
I can't even speak to you, Grandpa, because I know you're not, you're not for the world that, that I'm in now. And I haven't spoken to him since. No matter what I've said, he sealed me off. But I'm not stopping. It's a spiritual warfare. I remember when the enemy tried to pick off my kids. And, and I'm just telling you, and there are spiritual kids in this church. Some of you guys who are older saints, I'm telling you, you may feel limited. I, I want to give you, and Pastor, you might remember this. He's been going to Mardi Gras with me a long time. He's one of the early Mardi Gras. <laughs> but as groups began to come to Mardi Gras over the years, I will never forget it is embedded in my mind. And maybe it was you. I don't even remember who it was. But there was a group that came from West Texas, a group of Christians, and they had got hold of an old school bus. And I mean, they must have prayed all the way to Galveston. I mean, they, <laughs> that school bus was rocking with prayer all the way up. And they said, we brought our intercessor with us. And I op- they opened the door of the school bus. <laughs> and there was this woman. She must have been about 86 years old in a rocking chair. She was, they put the rocking chair up by the driver. And she said, we brought our intercessor with us. And all the kids got around the rocking chair and let, loaded her off. And we put her up in the, in the training room we were at. And Grandma, man, I'm telling you what, she never stopped praying while we were out in the streets. And those kids, would, they would get discouraged from people swearing at them and cussing at them and throwing things at them and spitting on them and stuff like that. And she'd come on, come on in, kids. Come on, get on your knees. And Grandma, let Grandma pray for you. And I mean, the old Grandma would light them up. I'm telling you, those kids, she just, she, I mean, she was like a giant set of uh, jumper cables. I mean, those kids would stay in there for 15 or 20 minutes, and they'd go blowing right back out in the streets, and off they'd go again. <laughs> I mean, but I'm just telling you something. We cannot underestimate the value of that. And some of you say, well, I'm really limited because of my age and because of my situation. No, you're not. You may be one of the church intercessors. You may not have a leg. You might not have an arm. I don't know what. You still got a mouth, and you still got a heart, and you still love Jesus Christ with all your heart. Then I would say, take up your cross. You know, you may have to lay it across your wheelchair, but go. All soldiers are needed in battle right now. You know, I had a friend of mine who was under, who, he was a, he he was sent out to, in Vietnam, he was sent to a hill to clean out a hill from the enemy, and they told him there's about 12 North Vietnamese in the, in the jungle and they need to go and purge that. So he took his men out there, and there wasn't 12, there was 120. And they walked into a setup that was unbelievable. He said, John, well, in less than five minutes, they picked off half the platoon. We were just being slaughtered out there. I mean, we, the intel we got was wrong. But he said, I got on my radio, and I, I called back to command. I said, you gotta, you got to send a jet. you got to send a helicopter. There's no way we're going to make it out of here. They're, all of my men are just shot up. And they're still, while well, he's calling on the radio, and the commander, listen what the commander told him. He said, son, listen to me. Everyone's out. There's no one coming. You tell those men that are left there to die well. You're Marines. You die well. And that was it. But at the same time, on the other side of the mountain were some army rangers who had been in another kind of firefight, and they, were, they had a medevac helicopters that were over there picking those boys up, all shot to pieces. Well, out of the clear blue, as they were lifting off to go back to command, the, the, cap, the, the commander of the, of the airship was turning his radio to adjust it, and he picked up that dialogue. And those wounded soldiers laying all bloodied up in the back of those helicopters heard it. And they said, go over the hill, fly low, and roll us out. We're all, if they're going to die, we're dying with them. He said, and those shot up men, they couldn't even land the helicopters because the fire was so bad over there. And he said, those men rolled out and with shot up legs and blown up arms, laid right next to us and held off those 120 North Vietnamese that were overrunning us. And, here's, and the reason why I say that is, is that, you know, when it's real war, God can use anybody. Amen. You don't have to be a shiny little penny. You can be somebody in a wheelchair or somebody where, I mean, those kids, that old woman, I never saw her get up out of that wheelchair the whole time she was there. 
And so I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is recruiting anybody that will go because it's a war. And God will take us, any of us, and fill us with the Holy Ghost. And so I'm telling you that as I look at this right here, you may not know Greek, you may not know Hebrew, you may not know, um, you know, you may not have a really fancy understanding of the Bible, but you got a basic understanding that you're born again and that you're filled with the Holy Ghost and that God has a call on your life to be an ambassador for Christ. Some simple, basic stuff. Saddle up. Saddle up. He put a gun in your hand. Amen. And so don't be like saying, well, what, I can't do it because I don't know this and I don't know that. Man, this has never been about head knowledge. This has been about knowing Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Here's what you need to know is where is your secret place with God. That's what you need to know. Every single one of you in here that named the name of Christ and have been walking with Jesus sometime need to be able to say, well, if I was to really be honest with you, this is where my secret place is. My wife, for ye- my wife for years, every Saturday morning, I s- uh, and I don't like doing this because it, what it does is, is it makes you feel like you're putting yourself up for people. I'm as human as you are. I have desires that are human as, you, as you'd have. But I tell you what, I told the church the other day, I said, there are times that my life is so busy and so chaotic, but I will make a vow to you that if I don't have a fancy sermon on Sunday, I will give you at least a prayed up heart. And I'll give you whatever the Holy Ghost gives me. I'm not going to come in here and try to intellectually woo you guys. I'm going to try to impart whatever is imparted to me. And so I'm not going to forgo my prayer life. I will not forgo it for the busyness of all this stuff out there. You guys with me? And so I believe that every one of us need to have that secret place. Now I want to move this forward a little bit. How, how are we doing on time, man? Are you keeping an eye on me? Okay. Because <laughs> I don't know it. All right. Matthew, the sixth chapter. It's Matthew 6, 1, it says, Take heed, take heed that you do not your charitable deeds before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward from your heavenly Father. Therefore, when you do charitable deeds, do not sound the trumpet before as the hypocrites in the synagogue and the streets, for they may have their glory of men. Surely I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you... Do your charitable deeds. Do not let your land hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deeds may be in, come on, secret. And your father which sees in, okay, will himself reward you openly. And when you, okay, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue On the corners of the streets, they may be seen by men. Surely I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, let's say that together, but you. Let's put your finger on your nose, but you. (laughs) We do that in the county jail. Okay, so we know none of you boys did anything to get in this place, but put your finger on your nose and go, I have a problem, and it's me. (laughs) All right. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door on electronics, on television, shut the door. Let me just say this to you. If you're still praying based on your your emotions, like, oh, when I feel like it, or when there's something warm and fuzzy, Let me tell you, I have spent hours and hours in prayer, and all I got out of it was a headache. I didn't feel like any of it. In fact, when I go into my secret place to pray, that's when the real warfare begins because the flies began to land on my head. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, You need to go to the bathroom, John. Okay, so I go to the bathroom real quick, run back in, close the door, get ready to pray again. Uh, I'm hungry. Let, well, let me go get one of those bars, and I'll put it on the table. And Well, I'm thirsty. Let me go get that. I'm just telling you, the battle starts right up here in my head, and I have to, by the will of God and the, and the will, free will he has given me, is to surrender to him and say, God, you know what? We're done scratching. We're done itching. We're done going to the bathroom. We're done getting bottles of water. And in the name of Jesus, I am going to burn through. I don't care what happens here. Hell freeze over. I'm gonna. We're going to pray. And I don't have to feel nothing. 
That's when the warfare starts. We lose a lot of Christians in that because they don't recognize that a lot of times your thought lives have to be brought under control. And that's why Jesus said when he went up into the mountain to pray before before he went to the cross and went back to his disciples, he said, you couldn't pray with me one hour, guys? Watch and pray. Lest you enter into temptation. What is the temptation? It's to do your will versus God's will. There's no way you're going to stay out of being tempted to do your thing, especially in America. We are so self-absorbed, it's unbelievable. And we even say we're not, you are. I have to fight it tooth and nail myself. But the church will never, never return back to power. I still remember in our young days as Christians when we really didn't have any, I mean, we, I have to hate to say it this way, but God did more through us by accident than he did on purpose. I mean, we just stagger into something and the Spirit of God would show up. I remember one night I took a couple of teenagers and we spent a couple of hours in prayer and it wasn't easy for the kids and we got in the car, and let's, let's just drive around, and let's just see what God says. And so we pulled up in front of a pool hall uh, for teenagers. And I said, well, get out. Let's, let's just go see. It was just me and him and one other. <laughs> so we wandered in there, and there's a guy sitting out front of the pool hall, Mr. Cool, you know, sunglasses on. And I walked up to him, and I said, hey, can I say something to you? Jesus Christ loves you. He died for your sins. And he said, oh, oh, my God. And he busted out crying on the sidewalk. And I said, why are you crying? He said, because two weeks ago, I responded to an altar call in a local church. But tonight, I decided to go back in the world I came from. And here you are picking me out in the middle of nowhere. And then listen to what happened. He said, uh, he's just crying his eyes out. He said, man, I've been busted. I said, well, you know what, and my compassion, I said, well, then, brother, let us pray for you. He said, not in private. My friends need to see what you're about to do. He went in the pool hall and brought them all out, and we made a big circle out front. I was like, what have we got into here, man? And one kid got upset when he found out what we were doing, so he hopped in his car. And I'm telling you, (laughs) I hate to say this because it's going to sound a little braggadocious, but let me brag on God. I said, young man. You cannot, we're all circled up, and this one guy got upset when he found out what we're circled up for because this guy's still crying. They can't figure out what's going on. They don't know who we are. So one guy, when he did find out we're going to pray, uh, he hopped into his car, got his car keys out. I said, you can't leave. You can't leave. The Holy Spirit has arrested you, and you can't go. And so he put the keys in his mama's car, and it was dead as a mackerel. (laughs) And he goes, oh, no. And I was like, oh, no. So we gathered up So we gathered up hands out there, and I'm telling you what, we not only had prayer, but I gave an altar call at the end, and uh, this guy is still squalling and bawling over here because he's been busted by the Holy Ghost. And that little night when we thought nothing was going to happen, all we did was just spend some time in what I call dry prayer, Dry, you know, nothing happened. We didn't have anybody prophesying or, you know, uh, hollering out for devils or anything else. I mean, it's just we just prayed. And I hate to say it that way, but, you know, some Christians don't want to do it sometimes when it's just praying. But that night was one of the nights I'll never forget. The Holy Ghost blew that place up, and we were just, I mean, we're just along for the ride. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we were just dumb enough to go do what God said after praying. But you got to get your secret life with God nailed down because we are heading into a storm, church. Amen? So let, let's look on down here. It says, um, And when you pray, do, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue. Assuredly, I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, let's say that again. But you, when you pray, go into your room and you have shut the door. Have I beat that dog to death already? Shut the door. I want to say it one more time. It's a free will deal. You have got, if you have decided to spend 15 minutes, I hate to use the time thing, but you have dedicated time to pray, then you go and shut the door. And then you also shut the door on thought life, and you shut the door on cell phones, and you shut the door on all the electronics that are driving us all crazy. Shut the door. 
because you're there to meet with the secret the, in the secret place with God the Father. He said, that's where you're going to find me is in the secret place. One time I made, I had, I made this commitment a long time ago before, before I ever went into ministry. I, worked, I was a union carpenter, and God had told me to, to start a prayer meeting in the middle of a plant. And men would come from everywhere and pack out this, this room. And one day I came, the, the plant cafeteria had chicken fried steak, and all the men forsook their prayer life for chicken fried steak. And I was so mad. I was in there fuming. God, look at them, men. They're sitting in the cafeteria having chicken fried steak over prayer. And I felt the Holy Ghost said, it ain't your problem. You made your commitment to pray. You pray. So I got down on my knees, and I just said, God, I'm so sorry for being so judgmental. And as I went to it, I, I, I had an hour break. And so about 15 minutes into it, I hate to use this because it sounds so over-spiritual, but I had a vision. I had a vision that out on the other side of the plant, uh, there was a, an, another job shack out there where the ships pull in and get, and get uh, cargo, I mean get uh, chemicals, it was a chemical plant, and and I'd never been down, I'd never even been in that unit, and, I, and I'd seen the job shack from, from the road. And so I thought, well, you know, there's nobody here to, I, I, anyway, I bowed down to pray 15 minutes into it. I have a snapshot in my mind of that job shack out by the ocean, and I saw a picture in my mind of a man on his knees. So I thought, you know what, this has got to be just me wanting somebody to pray with me or some crazy thing. So I got on my plant bicycle, pedaled all the way across the plant, got over there, opened up the job shack, and there was a man on his knees praying. Never met the man in my life, never saw him. And I got down beside him, and I said, I hope you don't mind, but I just, I'm here to pray with you. And we just end up finishing the hour together, loved on each other, shared a little word together, and never saw the man again. I don't even know if he really was a plant worker. He may have just been an angel. I don't have any idea. But I look back on that, and I think, you know what? Don't worry about it. And I was so proud that Pastor said 28 of you guys came in the other night to pray because I'm just saying to you the church is built on the foundation of prayer. Yes, there's lots of other things stacked on that, but I'm telling you that prayer meetings everywhere in my community, the pastors have given up on them, and they're all shut. Yes, sir. Okay, most pastors have given up. They just gave up. Why do you have a prayer meeting when nobody wants to come? But I'm telling you something. You've got to have private prayer, and it's okay if you, someone came and they're just wanting to pray. But I'm just saying something. The foundation is your personal private prayer life. And I said to my church the other day, could you imagine if all of you got up early Sunday morning? See, I, I'll use myself this morning. Because I've been running and gunning for months right now, and I, I'm staying in a hotel. There's nobody bothering me. And, and so I woke up this morning at 4. I looked at the clock, and I went, mm, one more hour is all I need. And I laid down, and all I could think of, I don't need that one hour. I need an extra hour in prayer is what I need. And so I drug my little nappy self up and put on the coffee pot, and I stood in there in the living room till I could finally shake myself off and wake myself up. And I said, John, you need to pray. You need to will to pray. The choice to lay down for one more hour is a lazy choice. That doesn't mean you're going to go to hell over it. It just means that I'm just saying make the choice to do it. The prisoners I work with on Monday night, we, we minister to 1,250 prisoners every Monday night. And so the guys that you make converse say, well, pastor, how do we pray? We're, in a, we're incarcerated in a dorm full of idiots. Hey, every one of you got a bunk, every one of you got a pillow. Get up there, pull your head over the pillow, and that becomes your secret place with God. And spend time with Jesus. Amen. Is that right? And so we began to shut the door and shut the door. I always wonder on nights that we pray at the church, where, where are all the believers? I know that sounds so, and I do know that there are always some legitimate issues. I never want to get self-righteous. But I think, what about the Christians that chose TV over prayer? We're watching our nation sliding into darkness as fast as it goes. There, there could come a time you don't even get a TV. There could come a time you get no AC. You get no la lazy boy chair to go sit down in. And... You know, here we are, comfort in Zion, laying around. Man, grab yourself up. You can always go take a nap later some other time when it's, you know, I'm serious. 
Some of us who are over a little older, you know, we, <laughs> we, we run out of steam. We run out of steam. But I, will, I don't want to run out of steam for what's important. And you can always say to myself, well, you know, I could take a nap around thus and so time, and, and sometimes I just, I just go sit still for 15 minutes and feel revived, and off we go. But I made up my mind, I'm not giving this up because we're old. You get old because you choose to be old. I mean, you may be getting older, but I have friends of mine in high school. I met, I met my, some of the men I worked with at, at Monsanto. Guys, that was in eighty. And they've all retired like 15 years ago. <laughs> and I met a batch of them at a funeral the other day, and, I, and, and they were like, hey, hey, I, you know, you left in 1984, yeah, and uh, all this other stuff. And, and I said, well, what are you guys doing? They said, oh, I'm glad you asked. We play dominoes all day. For what? You on a tournament or something? They said, no, there's a senior center. And then if you stay like at, by noon, you get Meals on Wheels. I said, and that's what you guys do? I said, well, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to play dominoes and, you know, and I, you know, I don't even know what they serve at Meals on Wheels. But, hey, God bless you guys, you know. Um, but I went home thinking, this is what retirement brought you? You never retire from the kingdom of God. You may not be running out at some big job somewhere, but you don't retire from the kingdom of God. If you did, then go back to work and jack yourself back up. I mean, you're choosing. I mean, some of these guys, I went and talked with them. Uh, 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 I'm like, we're the same age, and you can barely even talk. They've let their mind go to sleep on them, and they're so sloppy and lazy. It's pitiful. They've chosen to be old men. You're going to get older. You mean, that's a no-brainer. But you don't have to choose to be that. I mean, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and let Christ give thee light. And I'm not trying to be overly spiritual on this whole thing. I'm just saying, oh God, oh God, oh God. I mean, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. God, we need heaven to do something. Because I'm telling you what, the problem in America? You know, I, I watched a, a historian the other day who studied nations for the last 30 years. He's a professor at a school, and he got on one of those night shows, and he said, I am not a Christian. But I have studied the rise and fall of nations. The only hope left for the United States of America is a Christian revival. That's all that's left. Other than that, this nation is over. And he said, once again, I just let you know I'm not a Christian, but I have studied. And I know what it takes to bring a nation down. And I know what it took to bring a nation up. And I know, so I'm just saying to you that you want to know what's left in America. America is over. She's been bought and sold. And the only thing that could actually wake her up and get her back on track again is, is, is one of those Christian awakenings. See, he had studied those in history. And so we can't find any time to pray. And, and we've got, you know, there's a TV program and the kids have got to go do and Look, I'm not trying to be overly spiritual, but I'm saying because if you really don't have a secret life at home, then the prayer lives at church are kind of shallow, to be honest with you. But I can tell you this. Somebody asked one time, we, you know, at Mardi Gras, we had a, a visiting pastor. <laughs> you remember when we borrowed First Baptist Church? And it was so funny. I went in there, and, the, and I said, can we borrow your church for a little outreach? For what? <laughs> I said, well, we have young ministers from all over the country going to come, about 600. And our, you know, meeting, we, it's really hard to train them outside. So if we could borrow First Baptist right in the middle of the outreach, could, could we borrow it? And they got a balcony, and they got chandeliers. It is so fancy. Yee! It's fancy. So this deacon said, what kind of music? I said, what do you mean, what kind of music? He said, what kind of music are you going to play? Um, well, um, I, you know what? It's probably, in your mind, it's probably that charismatic kind of worship stuff. It's going to be worship courses. And all the, I'm in a room, a, a boardroom with deacons all around me, and I just decided to throw it on the table. And he stood up to yell at me. 
And this is what he did. He went, oh, oh. And he sat down. And he goes, what can we do to serve you? I was just fixing to be crucified. And the Holy Spirit swarmed him. And we jammed First Baptist Church with 600 animals, that kingdom animals that were ready to go fight in the jungle. Dr. Westbrook was with us. And in and, the middle, the whole balcony was full of deacons. All, oh, they were still folding their arms watching us. And I mean, the whole thing just blew up. In fact, the first worship course, the altar was filled. The altar was filled. The first worship course, they couldn't get up there fast enough. And, and I mean, the musicians were being pushed by the church. And, and then about 15 minutes into it, Dr. Westbrook wandered up and said, uh, if any of you young people need to be empowered by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, would you please line up? And old Doc was up there laying hands on kids all over the place. And he leaned over while he was praying. He leaned over and he said, John, the Holy Ghost in First Baptist Church. And he went back to praying. <laughs> we have a mission, amen? amen Find your secret place with God. Amen. Find it. I don't care if you've got to sit in the woods. I don't care if you've got to go crawl under a bed. What you've got to do, you need to find your secret with God. Now, Father, I thank you for these saints. I pray the power of the cross over this. Uh, uh, I pray, Lord God, that a revival of prayer. Pastor, can I say something? Can I have one minute, two minutes? One time, I want to say this to encourage you. One time, 25 years ago, I was preaching, and I got down, and I, and, and I said, Church, look, I know it's not on the bulletin, and it's not been planned, but I'm going to spend this next week in prayer. I'm going to open up the sanctuary from five o'clock, uh, from six o'clock in the morning to eight, and then at night I'm going to open it up. Anybody who would like to join me, I, I don't care if you. I'll just be my. If you don't want to, fine. I'm not. This is not a. It's not formal. I just feel like Holy Ghost wants us to pray a week. The next morning, I show up to go unlock the church, and the and the parking lot's full of cars. It's full of cars. They, the workers had a key. They had already been in there at five. And let me tell you what happened. I had no control over it after that. It went like that for six weeks. I couldn't even get my hands on. I mean, a preacher's got to touch stuff and, you know, plan things and all. All I could do was sit and pray. That's all. I opened it up at five in the morning, and they prayed, and at night the place was full. And you know what was really caught my attention? It was full of children, too. The kids were up there praying. It wasn't having a heard them and I said now that has got to be a real move of the Holy Ghost now I, let me finish it so I don't embarrass pastor the next week I, the next month the year I tried to manufacture that and it was me <laughs> you know last year let me tell you what happened and I said I'm gonna do the same thing and they, yeah well you know it took the breath of the Holy Spirit to wake up the church not browbeating everybody God bless you guys love you we'll see you in a couple